to ensemble these models outputs before you output a response um, to the user. So what I'm trying to say here, right, is that it's never deploying a model to production is never as simple as putting a model in a microservice in a cloud and expecting that what it produces is good enough um, for whatever application you're doing, right? It looks it will probably look something like this in the end, right? It gets it gets complicated pretty fast. So case in point, um, what Peter and Jawad showcased to you earlier with Lasso. Oh, sorry, not Lasso, I mean Jaeger. I'm too excited about my own thing, but yeah. So if you looked at um, what they had, right, um, what they had was um, multiple models, some sort of experimentation service, they had um, feature getting, they had post-processing, they had ensemble, right? And if you think about building something like this, sorry, okay, I'll talk about that later. So it's very difficult to think about um, a model in production as a model. You have to think about it as a predictive unit. So this is a term that was coined by um, the developers behind Selden, right, who is building, who built something similar, but it's way more featureful. So what um, I'm trying to say here is that um, when you want predictions from something, that something is usually not a model, but a system. A system of um, different entities doing different things, right? And can you imagine if you built this entire system within a monolithic application? Right, all that complexity would become something that's incredibly hard to handle, even for software engineers, right? Much less data scientists. And you want data scientists to not have to grapple with code um, as much as possible. I mean, you want them to code, right? They need to code to make their models, but you don't want them to be building um, massive, not even, massive microservices sounds a bit strange, um, large services um, to house their models, right? So the problem with something like this is that a lot of the code ends up being boilerplate, right? Um, you end up reusing the same code across your applications, and then it becomes very hard to um, make changes in one of them and not have to propagate them across all those other applications. Um, it's also very difficult to, to um, orchestrate all these flows um, within a single application because it's not immediately visible um, what each part is feeding to another, right? Um, and it also means that you're locked into a single language in this project, right? Which in machine learning can be quite a handicap, right? You would want, like for instance, um, let's say you've trained an XGBoost model, right? Um, usually you'd serve it with, nowadays you can serve it with anything, but um, back when this was built, um, you could you could only serve it with like Java or Python, while the rest of our the rest of the parts of our application we wanted to build in Go, right? So it was it was difficult, right? What's the next slide? So logically, what you want to do is break it up. You want these entities to live within their own services. Um, and interact with each other somehow, right? But the thing is that when you break, when you broken it up, how are you going to define the flow, right? Where does it, where does the logic for um, how this input flows into this input and how um, the request flows to all three models, where does that live? Do you put it inside each of the applications? The problem with that is that you have to, it becomes very difficult to make changes. You make one, you add one model, you have to change that model, you have to change this, you have to change that, and it becomes extremely difficult to maintain this system. And that's not what we want. So enter a lasso, um, which is something we built to, as, a, as a solution to this problem. It's a microservice orchestrator, which is an extremely big, wo big word, and very fancy sounding, but um, I hope it explains what it does somewhat, right? So it's supposed to orchestrate flows between um, different microservices. In this case would be services um, that comprise 
uh, predictive unit. Yeah. So by orchestrating these microservices, as you can see, Lasso would have access to each of the services within the predictive unit. It's able to execute workflows similar to how um, your Airflow DAG would be like, right? You define some sort of direct acyclic graph, your request would flow through this graph, and you get some sort of response. So what Lasso is, is that, um, sorry, Lasso is comprised of workflows. Right, so workflows are, as I described to you, um, a, a directed <laughs> acyclic graph of tasks. So there's a bag of tasks that um, Lasso is supposed to execute. And all of these tasks have access to an in memory JSON store. And when a request mm -hmm. comes in, Lasso will orchestrate um, the, Lasso will execute the tasks. Um, as they are required to as and whenever okay, let me let me let me show you later. Um, so let's all execute these tasks in turn, um, either synchronously or asynchronously, to produce some sort of response. So what will look something like this, right? You have some sort of op some set of options. So you're able to set um, which endpoint you want it to be at. Um, you're able to set a global timeout, which has proved to be very useful for data scientists. And you are able to define a bag of tasks, um, as I showed in the previous diagram. So what is a task? So a task is basically um, something that does something if the conditions are met. Right? So the way we've designed it is that you don't draw a graph. You define a task that only executes when certain triggers are fired. Right? So it's able to depend on either the content of the request other task statuses. So instance, for instance, if an upstream task has succeeded or failed, and also other task outputs, right? And the task, we have a variety of tasks that are currently built into Lasso. Um, we have tasks that can echo values, that can make HD calls, and also execute some sort of lambda, lambda function to transform um, the requests or the outputs of other tasks. So it looks something like this, right? So you have the task type, the configuration of the task, you have additional inputs to the task, um, output path that you want to put it in, and then the conditions to run. This is very extremely important. And then um, if you want this task to be exit, then there will be an exit flag. Yeah. So how does this whole thing solve the problem, right? Thanks to Lasso, microservices can have distinct roles. Right? You don't have to have a microservice um, do a bunch of things and do a bunch of things in a mediocre way. Right? You can write um, you can write a task that sorry, a service that processes data in a language that processes data well, for instance, Python. Right? You don't have to write it in like Go, which is like ripping your hair out, right? <laughs> and then there's also an encapsulation. The microservices don't necessarily have to know about each other, right? Only Lasso knows about them. So they can, they can basically heck care about the world around them. All they care about is whatever they get and whatever they have to return, right? <coughs> and also, similar services can be used for other predictive units. So instances of services <laughs> that can be reused to be like feature getters, um, Mainly feature getters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, there's no dependency on a single framework like or language, as I've explained in the first point. Right? You can have a predictive unit that comprises of, of microservices that are in Go, in Python, in Java, whatever um, your developer is comfortable with, or whatever is best suited for that task. Yeah. It also means that it's extremely easy to edit and iterate on workflows because you don't have to write additional code and the configuration of workflow sits outside of the definition of those services. Yep. Oh yeah, and boilerplate can be moved into Lasso. So for instance, we are planning to move um, feature getting into Lasso so that you don't have to write a service for that anymore. So it'll be a task. 
Yeah, so Lasso brings to the table some other nice things. Um, it's fast and it's scalable. Um, it's extremely lightweight. Um, it sits at the heart of, of Jaeger, so I know at least that it's able to handle the, the load that the Indonesia marketplace um, puts on it, right? So that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, also, because it's written in Go, it can be compiled to a single <coughs> executable that's very, very easy to deploy. Right? Um, we have a Helm chart for it. So all you have to do is to Helm install, provide it with a config map that has the workflow specification, and it works. That's it. <coughs> yeah. And then if you've seen from the previous slides, we also support Go templates, which will be similar to your Jinja template thing. Right? Um, it allows you to have logic inside your workflows. Right? Um, so you're able to do things like input and output validation, you're able to transform requests and responses, and so on. Yeah. And the nice thing about the workflow sitting outside of the <coughs> service definition is that you're able to version the workflow separately from the services. Yeah. There are some caveats though, like it's not, it's not all sunshine and roses in Nassau land. Um, there are trade-offs between la latency and type safety. So I mentioned the, the JSON store earlier, right? Um, the thing is that JSON can be very expensive to parse. It takes very long, right? Um, so what Lasso has done is that um, it opts for a lazy JSON parser that doesn't really care about um, how well-formed your JSON is. In exchange, it's able to pass the JSON extremely quickly. Yeah. So um, to handle validation, you have to write it in the lambda instead. Yeah. Um, it can also be memory intensive because we use an in-memory JSON store. Um, Go templates are also not intuitive to write. If you guys have written Jinja templating, it's, it's the same. Um, and yeah, most can get pretty big. And also, it's currently HTTP only. It's not cool, right? You need to handle GRPC, right? Yeah. So I think that's it. Um, I have a final slide with my didn't have on it because I didn't know what to put in the final slide. Uh, but yeah, I hope you enjoy what I have to say. Um, does anyone have any questions? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I have another question. Okay. Um, so I'll hand it off to Jared, um, who has a very important talk to say to you all. If you guys have any questions, just hit me up. Yeah, I remember like we'll have, we're not going to close shop immediately, so. Um, <laughs> You know, Peter and Java are going to be there, Jilin is going to be there, they're all very um, charismatic speakers. Um, but I will say this, that this is the first time I'm hearing the official version of why Jaeger is named Jaeger. I always assume that the team like to drink, that's why they call it Drank and Jaeger. Like, so, okay, yeah, let's go with that, Pacific Rim. Um, okay, cool, I am actually going to pivot a little bit and talk more about, thank you so much, um, burning out data science. And why is this an important topic is because most who, what's the most important thing when you are trying to, to launch a data science product? People. What is that sound? Um, it's people. Who said that? Thank you. Um, and the reason why I say people is because honestly, like the talent pool here in Singapore is, and Southeast Asia is, you know, and to a, to a large extent the world, like is very thin. Like you don't support people, they're going to burn out. They burn out, you don't get data science. So, a little bit more about me. Um, um, my name is Jairi Tan. I, it's pronounced Jairi without the T. Uh, here is my contact info if you want to get in touch with me later. Um, my current favorite animal is the penguin um, because they're just so cute. Look at that one. Um, even, even real life penguins are very cute. So, why, why do I care about um, burning out as a data scientist? Well. My task here at Gojek is simple. I support 46 or so uh, data scientists, and I'm here to help them in their career and to make sure that all of them feel supported by the organization. My background is very all over the place. Uh, uh, I used to work uh, as an economist at MAS, um, if you've heard of it. It's right across the street. I'm a bond breaker. <laughs> uh, I have strong opinions about the scholarship system. Please come talk to me. <laughs> uh, I worked at Flipboard, which is an app that has since um, 
gone on to do to greener pastures. I was the first data scientist I worked on churn models, data hack, uh, growth hacking. At Facebook, I started out as a data scientist on groups. Then I transitioned into a software engineering role on A/B testing. Then I quit and started my own consulting business. Published a paper in the Lancet on Bayesian meta analysis. Uh, and now I'm here supporting my teammates. Um, and I've, I, I, I have to say, like these people are on point. You know, I. I've been around the world. That's a song from the 80s, in case you didn't know. No? You know what? <laughs> and uh, I have to say that the talent here at Gojek is like stellar. Um, and I've really been impressed by all of my teammates. Um, so I'm living proof of the fact that you can have many careers and you can reinvent yourself, um, even if you're not Madonna. Uh, so what happened to me at Facebook? I, I burned out. In 2014, my best friend died, and I didn't take any time off because I was I was young. I was back then. I was in my twenties. Um, I still am. Uh, <laughs> um, and I was just like powering through, right? And then in 2015, Facebook grows huge. Like that's when they had a doubling in size of headcount at Facebook. Uh, by 2016, in January, I was physically exhausted. And in 2016, in March, I actually had to take two months off of work. And in November of that year, I left Facebook. And then soon after, trained as a yoga instructor, focusing on mindfulness, and then started my own consulting business. Now, why, what is burnout and how do you recognize it? There are three points here. It's exhaustion, cynicism, and attachment. Oh, excuse me. Exhaustion, cynicism, and feeling in ineffective and unaccomplished. So, exhaustion is pretty obvious. Um, I put a picture of Yoda here, because I think Yoda is cute too. Um, but, you can read the symptoms by yourself, but it's important to know that exhaustion can refer to both physical and emotional exhaustion. So if you feel like you're irritable and like that you're short with your colleagues, that's an example of um, uh, exhaustion. Um, cynicism and detachment refers to a lack of enjoyment when you engage with your work. You start to feel pessimism, you start to isolate yourself. I did this a lot at Facebook towards the end of my career there. Um, and detachment refers to things like I go in late or I don't really like want to engage my colleagues. Um, the last point is feeling ineffective and note that feeling ineffective can also be a cause of being ineffective. So it becomes like a vicious circle. Um, so congratulations, if you exhibit 55% of these symptoms, you may be suffering from burnout. And that's not a good thing because burnout equals attrition. I mean, from an organizational perspective, but for you, burnout means burnout, and that's bad too. <laughs> so, um, why do data scientists burn out? And I think that there's something unique about burning out as a data scientist, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a couple of hypotheses, precisely six. One, this field is full of media hype. So there is a myth that data science can do everything, but it, in reality, it can do you know, some things really well, like it can play code but it cannot really stand in for product or design, which I think we often, as data scientists, get involved in conversations where you know, our PMs or our directors ask us, like, so should we launch or not? And then you're like, um, <laughs> hey. <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> cool. Um, hypothesis two, it's a lack of clarity about what we do. And this has to do with media hype, but it also has to do with the fact that we're a relatively young field. And we do so much. We do machine learning, we do statistical inference. I love, like, I train as a statistician. That's, that's where I, I think I shine at. Software engineering, we do data visualization, and also sometimes we're expected to, to tell stories. And not all of us are going to, and this is not an exhaustive list here, yeah? not all of us are going to be good at all parts of this, um, of, of this list. Hypothesis three. Data is where product and engineering disagree. Because engineers tend to be realists and product managers tend to be idealists. And data science often gets caught in the middle. How many of you have fixed the logging bug? No? Oh my gosh, really? Y'all, you all are li living the life. I have fixed a logging bug so often where like the PMs define one thing as one, one as something and the engineers just like increment the wrong part of the app. You know, and like all the metrics look crazy, all the results look crazy, and then like I'm the one that has to like chase it down. That's where product and engineering, that's an example of where product and engineering really disagree. I'll leave some time for questions later. Um, this point.
point, it's important to know that the data science life cycle is very, very different from the product life cycle or the engineering life cycle. Because why we have actually, engineering, you, you tend to go from prototype to implementation to maintenance, to deployment, maintenance, and improvement. But for us, there is a front-loaded analysis portion, right? Because we're not going to execute unless we have a fairly good idea that it's going to produce good results. And how many of you have been involved in daily sprint stand-ups where, where you're expected to just say, uh, I'm still researching, um, same as yesterday. Yeah, oh, right, right? Um, very exhausting, right? <laughs> the other thing to note is that we're often, often by the organization. If you work at a startup, the data science person is usually not the second or third hire. It's usually like the 20th hire. And then when you get there, like the engineers kind of look at you like you're a bit crazy, you know, like, um, and when you report into engineering, you are reviewed and ranked against engineering standards, which tend to ignore the front-loaded analysis portion, and when you report into product, you're reported again, uh, you're reviewed and ranked against product standards, and who knows what those are, I, I'm sorry, um, I love my, I love my product managers and everything, but sometimes I, like, don't really see eye to eye, so who advocates for data scientists? That could be in the course of right now. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the last thing is the relative lack of mentors and managers. And I think really, when I was at Facebook, this was the number one reason. Like, because data science was such a young field then, I, like, I was 12, you know? And um, um, I'm not 22. Um, and um, my... My managers were just 14, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating. My manager was actually younger than, than me at that point. And, you know, he, bless his soul, but he, he tried his best. And, you know, the issue here is that a lot of us data scientists, we have an obsession with being technical, which somehow has become, has come to mean, like, I, I know how to use deep learning. Um, but we don't realize that in order to leverage ourselves, we need to leverage ourselves in terms of talent rather than technology. Right? Because when do you really encounter a problem that like deep learning or like whatever the like I, I come from statistics so like right now everything is Bayesian, right? Like when 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 does that Bayesian approach like buy you, you know, the, the twenty percent win? Not really. <clears throat> so give these are my hypotheses. How do I think that we can prevent burnout? The number one thing is to set expectations, right? I when I work with my team here at Gojek, I continually help them to remind stakeholders that data science cannot answer every question. In particular, don't get data science to answer really hard business questions that are at the intersection of product engineering, design, and UX research. We are a voice at this table. Yes, I agree. We can provide a lot of valuable insights. We can provide a lot of valuable strategies on how to grow, but we cannot solve everything. Uh, um, the other thing to note is that we, uh, we, we have to be very cognizant of where we are in the data science life cycle, which means that when we are in the research or analysis phase, we have to really be aggressive at telling other people to, you know, give us some space to breathe, to say it nicely. I was about to use like a, a, an ex expletive. Um, <laughs> And each phase requires different skills, different cadence of check-in, and different project management techniques. We start to answer very broad and open questions at first. Data scientists answer broad, open questions at first that kind of converge on an implementation solution, right? And we have to, to be able to recognize this and advocate for ourselves. Um, another thing that you could probably do is to ask for organizational clarity. As I said, being a data scientist at an early startup sucks because you're too late to be founder, but too early to be a comfortable employee. <laughs> um, a lot of you are laughing because probably it's true. Uh, and being a data scientist at a big company can suck because you're often caught between product management and engineering, but you have none of the authority. And you may also have to compete with other data teams like data engineering or product anal analytics. I think in the face of this, you can ask yourself what data science as an organization and your teammates, what you all can uniquely do and focus on those things. And once you get clarity on what it is that you should do, other people should listen to you when you are the authority on that. And I think that this requires a lot of, of, of 
of self-awareness and the ability to advocate for yourself. Um, the last thing, I think it's the last thing, um, but uh, I, I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping that this is the last slide, so I'm not putting my, sh my foot in my mouth, um, is to find mentors. Um, you find mentors inside the organization, so you get more senior data, data scientists within your organization to mentor you, but you also, outside the organization, use these meetups to find counterparts that you can bounce ideas off of, and, and that's what I hope that you will do with DSSG tonight. Um, but the more hidden and more valuable thing, I think, is because we're such a young field, you may not necessarily get mentors with, with that much more experience than you. You know, as I said, I'm only 15. Like, they're not that, wait, wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm only 22, yeah. Like, uh, and this field is only, what, six years old? Like, who else is here to like, help me? Um, so, one of the ways that you can overcome that is to become a mentor yourself. And peer mentorship, I think, is where you start to learn a lot. And that's actually how I got started in this business, by helping my teammates um, and, 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 and shepherding them through, through tough times. And in doing so, I built trust, and they also mentored me when I needed them. So these, this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, of why burnout happens um, and how to prevent it. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it will spark a good conversation. Um, and if you're interested in being a manager or a team lead here at Gojek, please come email me. This is my name, jire at gojek.com. Um, and we have one last video, but I feel like the, the sound is a little off and we're, or it's all right now. Uh, well, um, we can watch this video, but before that, do you have any questions for either me or Julian? Can you give an example of when um, you were asked to answer a stupid, sorry, complex <laughs> business question that yeah. really wasn't well posed? I'm not covered by a Facebook NDA anymore, right? <laughs> so I worked on groups, right? And one of the last projects I worked on was a group app. The standalone groups are. How many of you have heard of it? Exactly! <laughs> right? Like, um, <laughs> because then they would just like, basically every week they'd be like, oh, did we hear my tricks? And then they'd turn to us and be like, so should we launch or not? I'm like, I don't know, it depends on what you think the business value of this is and whether you think that having a standalone groups app is part of your entire strategy of having individual products be broken out into their own separate apps. And then they'd be like, should we launch or not? <laughs> like, you know, you get into those weird like conversations which are very like on loop where, and you have to start recognizing this, right? When you are asked to behave like a product manager, like to make product decisions because your product manager is <laughs> not bold, not bold, um, you should, you should, find a way to figure out, you know, and say like, hey, like, I have provided you with the best information that I can. We need to have a multifaceted approach to decision making at this company because you can't simply just look at me and say like, data is all the answers. We often do. I mean, we're, we're, we're geniuses, but, but we often don't. Any other questions before we play this video? Uh, yes. Sorry, I, I had a question about Lasso. Um, yes, Jilling. <laughs> since regarding, thank you. Since regarding pre-processing, very often it's a part that actually is duplicated. You have pre-processing uh, when you're training a model the first time, and then you have pre-processing for live requests. And uh, I'm not entirely sure whether you were using the same code, the same components, uh, basically in Feast or or in, in live pre-processing. Oh yeah, excellent question. That's where uh, Feast comes in. Please uh, like and star us on GitHub. <laughs> um, okay, so the way Feast is able to help you um, in this part of the machine learning workflow is that um, we do our pre-processing outside of the app, right? It's done inside the stream. So in our case, we do it in Beam, right? So if it's real-time data, it passes through that stream, it's transformed, and ideally, what comes out of it is a pure feature. It's whatever you need for your model. So um, whatever 
goes through that stream would ideally be something that could be shared across multiple predictive units. Yeah, so does that answer your question? Absolutely, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. We're going to play this last video and then um, um, uh, hand it back to the organizations, uh, organizers of DSSG. How do I play this video? Just click the button. But there's no button here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me guess. You love making mobile apps. Bitcoin predictors and flippy bird games. That's cute. Me? I'm a super app. Yeah, that's right. Super. Name's Gojek. Baby app killer. How am I super? Hmm. School's in. Ready to learn some stranger things? Here we go. Welcome to Indonesia. Crown jewel of the east. 18,000 plus islands, but 22 billion minutes wasted in traffic. And the land of me, Goja. Super app. Me, my transport, delivery, food, and Paris, massage. Ooh, nice. Payment, bills, rewards, shopping, business. You get the point. I do 100 million orders every month. Wait, what? No. Yes, you heard me. 18 plus products for 261 million people. Who are you gonna call? Me. I do it all faster than you can be with Scotty. Still with me? Good. Think you're a linguist? Say, Makasimas. To one of the largest JRuby, Java, and Go clusters in Asia. One in four Indonesians have me in their pocket. Even your grandma. Every day, my riders cover 16.5 million kilometers. That's more than 21 round trips to the moon. Does your app go where no man's gone before? I didn't think so. Oh. Sorry, Neil. Most importantly, 2.5 million people rely on me for their income every day. I help fill bellies, run businesses, and move an entire nation. I know. Where do I get the energy? Wait, now going to other countries too? Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, and Philippines? You ready? Now, what were you saying? Right, you're looking for a job. Say something super? Come help us, slave. for joining us for the meetup today and of course thank you to Gojek for sporting venue, food, having their speakers share with us. How many of you here have actually looked at the Feast GitHub? Who is the last committer? <laughs> well, it's your very own speaker. So, yes! so if you want to find out more about Feast, check, uh, talk to her. Gojek also has an excellent medium blog. Go check it out. They have tech, they talk about life, they talk about culture, everything about that. So, I mean, I'm sure the speakers will be hanging around a while as well so just do whatever you want if you want to head home you're tired it is has been a very packed meetup with a lot of content so after that that's it thank you everyone